Hello, and thank you all for joining us online today. I'm Shelby Smith Wilson, Deputy Director of the Foreign Service Institute. It is my great privilege to welcome you to today's Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Ceremony, which honors locally employed staff and political assistant Mitko Bruszewski. Over his more than 30 year career, Mitko's heroism and courage has helped the U.S. government promote peace, stability, and security in North Macedonia and across the Balkan region. Since 2019, the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative has shared stories of historical and modern day heroes who have displayed policy, moral, or physical courage while advancing the State Department's mission. These stories shed light on the unsung contributions made by past and present members of the Department of State's Foreign Service, Civil Service, and locally employed staff. Yesterday, missions throughout the world celebrated locally employed staff and Foreign Service National Recognition Day. This annual celebration gives us the opportunity to recognize the work and commitment that more than 55,000 locally employed staff make each day to help the department further its mission. During my time in the Foreign Service, I have been privileged to work closely with and learn from numerous locally employed staff, included, including first-rate consular teams in Kenya and the Dominican Republic, and outstanding political specialists who advised me in Colombia, Panama, and Spain. Their expertise was instrumental in my career. We thank our LE staff colleagues for working alongside us in some of the most dangerous places in the world to advance US foreign policy for the American people. We truly could not do our jobs without you. So today, we pause to recognize Mitko for his selflessness and brave contributions. By providing the United States with a nuanced understanding of a local national, he advanced the US and North Macedonia's mutual goals, including stability, humanitarian rights, and a free Europe. Mitko's dedication to conflict resolution, democracy, and the advancement of his own nation has enhanced the causes of peace and justice in the region. Thank you to our participants, audience, and especially to Mitko's family and friends for joining us today. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our colleagues and friends joining us remotely from US Embassy Skopje. I would also like to thank the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support of the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative. In addition, I would like to thank our partners in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs for joining us to bring this deeply moving story to life for today's program. Finally, I am honored to welcome today's speakers, Assistant Secretary for European and Eurasian Affairs, Karen Donfried, a foreign policy expert who has written extensively on German foreign and defense policy, European integration and transatlantic relations, and Ambassador Angela Aguilar, who I understand worked with Mitko when she served as public affairs officer at the embassy in North Macedonia from 2010 to 2013. And now I would like to turn the program over to Assistant Secretary Don Fried. Good morning to everybody from Washington. Thank you all for taking the time to join today's program. It is wonderful that we could come together from so many locations to honor Mitko Borchevsky, a hero of US diplomacy. It's only fitting that we recognize Mitko for locally employed staff FSN Recognition Day. This year's theme is mission inclusion. Every day, our locally employed colleagues contribute in numerous ways to our missions abroad. Their expertise and insights are invaluable, and they are a vital part of our global team. Mitko has worked alongside the United States in North Macedonia from the Republic's beginnings and has helped shape the country into a multi-ethnic democracy, NATO ally, and European Union candidate. It has been a long journey. The breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s was a time defined by crises, violence, protests, and political upheaval throughout the region, 
including in the then former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. The Department of State was proud to be at your side in this challenging time of transition to democracy. With MITCO as its first permanent employee, Skopje's U.S. liaison office became a U.S. embassy in 1996. A few years later, during the Kosovo crisis of 1999, the then former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia welcomed more than half a million refugees across its border. Despite this placing another large burden on a young nation already facing its own difficulties, North Macedonia was ready to lend a helping hand to those in need. The country found itself on the brink of civil war in 2001, when tensions between ethnic Macedonians and the Albanian National Liberation Army erupted into violence. The resulting O-Read agreement temporarily subdued a violent ethnic conflict in the Balkans before spiraling into war. North Macedonia persevered and joined NATO in 2020. It has been a strong ally both bilaterally and in the multilateral arena. Skopje is bound for another leadership role in the near future as they take the chair in office for the OSCE and assume the presidency for the Adriatic Five Countries in 2023. Mitko too has been there from the very beginning. As the first permanent employee, he helped to establish the mission's operations. Over the next three decades, he courageously supported U.S. Embassy Skopje through some of the most challenging circumstances. Let me just name some of his notable contributions. Advocating for and monitoring the construction of the Stenkovic refugee camp, one of the biggest in Macedonia. Leading embassy staff underground to safety during an attack by pro-Serbian demonstrators and helping to facilitate the acceptance of constitutional changes to the ORID framework agreement, thus avoiding reigniting a violent ethnic conflict in the Balkans. Mitko, I commend you for your extraordinary work, your self selflessness and unwavering dedication to support the US mission, Americans abroad, our deeply held shared democratic values and initiatives to sustain peace in the region. Warm congratulations again on an honor so well deserved. I will now turn the program over to Angela Aguilar, U.S. Ambassador to North Macedonia for a conversation with Mitko about his story. Thank you so much, Ambassador over to you. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary John Freed. What a great honor it is to be here today. Thank you for that introduction for our astonishing, wonderful colleague, Mitko. Uh, I have known Mitko since 2010. I've worked personally with him during my previous time here between 2010 and 2013 in Skopje. And I know very well firsthand that, that his courage, his dedication and tenacity um, the impact that they have had on both the stability of this country, North Macedonia, and the strengthening of the relationship between our two countries. As the Assistant Secretary mentioned, North Macedonia's leadership role within the Western Balkans and beyond might literally not have been possible without the work that my friend Mitko has done throughout the years. I also know from personal experience that his ability to get the job done is matched only by his ability to tell a story. <laughs> so bearing that in mind, uh, Mitko, let's get right into it, shall we? All right. Uh, you were the, as the Assistant Secretary said, you were the first permanent employee of the US Liaison Office before this even became an embassy. Oh, what was it like to get the mission up and running and to hire the first locally employed staff? In uh, 1994, I was working for the CSC spillover monitor mission to Skopje. They were supposed to spot early signs of uh, spillover of the crisis from Kosovo and in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And that's exactly what they did. They just 
monitored. They didn't do anything to prevent it. Anyway, uh, I worked under Ambassador Robert Froick, uh, Ambassador G. Norman Anderson, and um, State Department offices at loan to the CSC. And then one day came to me a guy and he said, is this the CSC? I said, yes. I said, do you know Mit Koburchevsky? I said, yeah, it's me. And he said, do you want to work for me? I said, excuse me, but who are you? <laughs> and then he gave me a business card. He was one Adolf Ravirez admin officer. And uh, then I checked with G. Norman Anderson, the, my, the chief of the mission, and he said, okay, Mitko, you can go work four hours for them and four hours for us until you find the replacement. But back in those days, the CSC mission was, the, the public was still with the Yugoslav mindset up. The foreigners were all spies and nobody wanted to work for them. So I ended up working uh, seven and seven oh. instead of four and four. And when uh, we went to the offices of the, what was to be the liaison office of the United States of America, we saw it was right across the street from where now the Marriott Hotel is. And what I found there was just uh, two floors of uh, floors, ceilings, and windows. And one uh, handmade bench that the workers had uh, forgotten, a cardboard box of documents that uh, Rod Moore had left and uh, a white laptop that we didn't know how to use. <laughs> now, that's how we started. And that's how we, that's how, that's where we started. Now, back then the inflation was at, I don't know, 1000% a day or something like that. And we were supposed to start setting up a mission. So uh, with uh, the admin officer who had different understanding of the Balkans than I did. He would have probably been a great admin officer or was a great admin officer in uh, Finland or Sweden or some <laughs> better organized country than, than Macedonia then. And so went to the post office to get phone numbers. And uh, Mr. Ramirez explained that, all right, now, send the fax to Sophia. Sophia will cable, I don't know, Antwerp and Antwerp will cable back. And in 90 days, you will have your money. And then this guy, Nino Stamato, he was a acquaintance of mine. And he said, okay, come back in 90 days. And I said, but you know, where the US government, we need these phones now. I cannot pay before I receive service. And he said, I cannot deliver service before I receive payment. So I said, hold it. And I reached down my pocket and I paid for the first two phone numbers of the liaison office of the United States, 116180, the switchboard, and 117103, the fax machine. Now, after that was resolved, you know, I, I got paid, I'm not complaining here, you know. That, 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 that. <laughs> That's uh, still how we do it, by the way. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> and after that, we didn't have, we didn't have handsets. So we're looking around to rent, uh, but the, the uh, not knowing the culture, you don't rent phones in Macedonia, particularly not if you're the American government and you're, you're considered you know, rich, powerful, you go out and buy things and when you don't use them, you throw them away. And uh, so as we couldn't find phones to rent, I went back home and my wife, uh, Slazina, she said, here's your phone. And she gave me a little red phone, a red phone that she found in a bag of aerial washing powder. So the first telephone conversation <laughs> outside this embassy was made on a red phone, you know, with the mm -hmm. digits uh, that my wife found in a, in a bag of area of washing powder. After that, you know, we were running around ministries uh, collecting necessary permits for the import of, uh, of uh, furniture for the embassy and for the import of cars. Our first official car was my car. It was a uh, Ford Sierra. <laughs> we didn't have a car, we had to drive something. And then uh, once we got to know, everything was new. We were new to the Macedonian government. They were new to us. Customs didn't know what to do. We couldn't set up an office because we didn't have a stamp and we couldn't get a stamp because we didn't have a registration number. So I went to one of the stamp makers and I said, look, we're a diplomatic mission. 
Can you help me with the stem? He said, I understand your frustration, but I will need your uh, a Xerox of your ID card and some sort of a letter. And so I did that. I signed a piece of paper. I gave him my uh, ID card. And he made a round step that said USLO, United States Liaison Office. So we could start clearing uh, goods through customs. Wow. And uh, after that, one person was not enough. So we decided to hire somebody. And I had excellent uh, co workers in the spillover monitor mission. And the first one we I called over was one we called Rakijev. Back then, we didn't know what a cable was. We didn't know we just did things for the embassy to, to grow. And then we took uh, Mimosa no more. Yeah. She still is in protocol. And then it started rolling. We got uh, Rosita Mrinoski, I got uh, I, uh, the Australian, Aussie, Zoran <laughs> Temelkovsky. And as we were growing, things are coming to place. We established great cooperation with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, great diplomats there. Some of them are now ambassadors and, and they were just young kids uh, back then. And uh, of course, customs, yeah, this is the first team. And this is when we set up the embassy sign. Mm. This is the, the embassy sign uh, in downtown. This is right across the street from the Marriott Hotel. And this is in the kindergarten where the embassy moved. Uh, That's so great. Victor Comras was nice enough to give me the office to sit in as political assistant in the in, in the kindergarten, uh, in which I used to sit in when I was teaching English in that kindergarten, and I knew the setup pretty well. I was teaching five and six years old kids there, <laughs> and um, so now this is the, this embassy is already big. We have here the public. Public affairs merged mm -hmm. with us, and then That's some right. of these people are uh, from uh, USAID, which was a separate operation. And uh, this is when we were in the, actually, people still call it the embassy. Mm -hmm. Back in That's the right. days, if you wanted to get, to come to the embassy, you get in a taxi, and uh, you didn't say, take, take me to, if you say, take me to the embassy, they will take you to the American embassy. For every other embassy, you have to be specific. You know, like German, <laughs> Dutch, and Romania. Yeah, this is a this brings great memory. Well, let me also say, Mitko, that I think Slajanai is a co-hero in a lot of these stories. So thank you for uh, mentioning her <laughs> contribution of the phone. But I must say something. Uh, this uh, it's a strange support that I get from my wife. <laughs> I guess. Um, but uh, I still love her the same as I did on December 9, 1983, when he first started dating. Oh, yeah. I love that. All right, listen, Mitko, one of the stories that I, I have heard, but I think is, is crucial to, to your, your career path and what you and your contribution is, uh, is during the Kosovo crisis in 1999, when the then former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia uh, welcomed uh, close to a half a million half a refugees. Million, yes. um, and you were absolutely instrumental, as the Assistant Secretary mentioned, in the creation of the Stankovic uh, refugee camp. Tell us a little bit about how you got the idea oh. and what inspired you to act. Uh, when uh when uh, NATO started bombarding Yugoslavia. First there was a stream, then a riverlet, and then a torrent, and eventually a flood of refugees from Kosovo. People were uh, running away, uh, fearing uh, uh, the Serbian, Serbian forces. And uh, the Macedonian government acted as, as if uh, they were prepared. They had, they, said, they had said, we have plans for 20,000 refugees, which was obviously, uh, not enough. So uh, the, the border crossing point, Blace, was literally clogged by, by refugees, by poor people coming from Kosovo. And uh, there was this little area along the river where people's walking have turned into slush, like a smoothie kind of, it was all mud. So hundreds and hundreds of people 
the Macedonian government was playing a uh, good cup, bad cup, opening, closing the border. And um, we saw people coming across from the mountains, but those were small numbers and they would simply you know, disappear into the families, into the villages with their, with their families, friends, acquaintances, or simply generous people who would take, who would take refugees. But obviously the pressure was, was growing. Nobody helped. Um, uh, you know they couldn't they couldn't get on the train and transit to Turkey because then Greece did not recognize Macedonian railroads mm -hmm. and so forth. So I don't consider myself an emotional person. To the contrary, I kind of lean towards cynical. But <laughs> um, <better>. yeah, <laughs> thank you. But um, one day I I saw this woman carrying her baby, you know, and. The, the, the shirt was one sleeve through the other knot. And the little baby had only one, one sock uh, on, on his hair, I don't know what it was. And um, I was really, uh, I don't wanna say touched, but kind of something clicked here. And um, I said to Charlie whom, Charlie Stonecipher was my boss then, and we kept going to the border. We, we were at the border literally every day. And I uh, said, Charlie, we got to find a solution for these people. Otherwise, you know, we'll be stuck more than them. Because there were two reasons for us to think about removing the people from the border. That was the only way NATO could drive in mm -hmm. to Kosovo. And with the people on the border, you, couldn't, you simply couldn't do that. So we drove around and um, and I remembered uh, I was I have this crazy neighbor who was a crop dusting pilot <laughs> and we used to take off from that field mm -hmm. either to um, you know for skydivers to jump out of his plane yeah wow. this is the this is this is after this but also before so this is Charlie Stone Cipher uh, four weeks ago he came to visit me. Uh, we wow. had drinks and we visited the the, the airport. That's incredible. And uh, with Charlie, we went to the airstrip and there was water. It was fenced off and uh, there was electricity. And right from this spot where Charlie stands, Charlie is the mm -hmm. guy in the uh, color photo. And um, it was from that point that we saw a group of British officers, one General Michael Cross, mm -hmm. who were thinking about setting up a fuel base there. And we asked them if they would lend us uh, men mm -hmm. to build a refugee camp. Because back then the politics was such, the American military, they said, we're here to fight. We're not here to build refugee camps. And the, the Brits, we managed to persuade them and then we went and we boxed this with the Macedonian government, late President Boris Strykovsky. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry now, I was often rude with him <laughs> in my meetings. And I was telling him, what the hell are you doing, man? I mean, the people, we have, we became, the, Macedonia became the laughing stock of the international community because no official visited thousands and thousands of refugees. Mm. And then Boris Strykovsky visited once and he was a good man. He was a minister, Methodist mm -hmm. or something. And then he confronted the government and they allowed the construction of the refugee camp. Now the Royal Engineers, they built this camp, the, 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 in the upper left uh, mm -hmm. corner, they built it in 48 hours and we housed almost 65,000 people there. And President Clinton visited my camp. It was you know, incredible. Yeah. So as part of, I think an integral part of the story, Mitko, is uh, is the search and rescue missions that oh. you held. Uh, because that is, this is, it's one thing that you created, what you told me, the largest refugee camp from after World War II. Um, but this was extraordinary as well. Uh, we had a mission in Kosovo, uh, KDOM or something like that. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, many colleagues, FSNs, worked for them. And I had a great contact in the Ministry of uh, 
interior in Macedonia, who was in charge of foreigners. That was his job. And so we'd go into the crowd, calling out people's names. Some would recognize me and, you know, oh, Mikko, yeah. and then we'll pull them out of the mud, put them on a car, and then they would either go to their families or just drive, uh, go through Macedonia into Albania or elsewhere. Uh, we knew that uh, there were politicians in the in the line of people on the Serbian side of the border, actually, of the, what is now Kosovo. Is. And uh, we knew that the Serbian pressure would be uh, relaxed if there are no politicians in the group of people waiting mm -hmm. to cross into Macedonia. So uh, I would make signs and, uh, you know, go there and like the people at the airport, you know, you go there and you call somebody's name. The last person I pulled out of the line uh, later on became a Kosovo uh, ambassador to Macedonia. He was uh, George Dedai, the leader of the then Liberal Democratic Party of Kosovo. Uh, you don't think then. So everything I had on my mind was what if these people remain here? Because the only chance for the refugees to go back was for NATO to win. And the only chance for NATO to win was for the border to open. And that's um, Charlie Stone Seferi was the man with the vision. And uh, Ambassador Chris Hill too, you know, he yeah. picked up the phone and he spoke to uh, Stroke Talbot and said, oh, we have this idea. And Stroke Talbot said, yeah, you have the money in the funnel. I didn't even know what funnel means back then but uh removing removing these people from the border made the nato operation Kosovo feasible and removing politicians from uh the lines who made the the cues a less desired target for the serbian paramilitaries i i was looking for a one Fehmi Agani, I couldn't find him, but you know, he had taken the train to across the border and the mm -hmm. Macedonian authorities sent the train back and the Serbs uh, got him and uh, you know, executed him. And, you know, that was, there, there was only so much we could do on this side of the border. One of uh, the people that pulled out of the mud is now working at the mailroom, our own uh, uh, I'm, uh, I didn't know Shabani. That. Yeah, and we found apartments for uh, colleagues from Kosovo. And it was such where, you know, a friend in need is a friend indeed. And that's that's what we did. We, we helped people. Um, well, speaking of helping people, and as though 1999 wasn't uh, as interesting enough, uh, there was March 25th, 1999, when the embassy was attacked by yes. pro-Serbian demonstrators. And you were frankly integral to leading staff away and from, uh, and, and from uh, mitigating some of the, the potential danger. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that day. I will, but I think that it is not as much me as the good management of, of Ambassador Hill. Because he took care of the, he took care of the officials on the phone mm -hmm. and I took care of the scared people in uh, the com com what do you call the the, vault, the communications? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it started with a bunch of kids playing the guitars and singing "Give Peace a Chance." Ambassador Hill joked through the crowd along the river. He came back, and then uh, at the end of the working hours, the crowd grew and people started throwing eggs. The Macedonian police gave us a. Uh, Plain, no, uh, blue uniform. We didn't have, you know, the, the people with the, no, no mm -hmm. riot control units. I was trying to call my contacts. They were all busy. I realized later that they were at the reception, at the Greek embassy, and their phones were off and stuff. Anyway, uh, as tensions grew, I'm sure there were people who knew how to control the crowd, and so did the animosity. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Terrifying. All these kids are from my neighborhood, you know, I know them. You know, I used to help them do their English homework. Anyway, uh, 
they, Ambassador Hill went around and he told people to leave. Then the last left at around five o'clock. And then he came to my office and said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm working for you because from my office, I had a view of the protesters and I was typing. And so um, he led us to the vault. What I contributed with was as usual with information because it was in that kindergarten that I was teaching English. And once a month we had, you know, duck and cover yeah. and uh, we had these exercises. And I knew that we were in a safe place, which was underground outside the floor of the, of the kindergarten of the embassy. So Ambassador Hill was afraid that there might be uh, not enough air. So I showed him where the tunnel was mm -hmm. to get out and I advised him against getting out or taking a stone and throwing it at the embassy if he pops up yeah. out of the ground <laughs> in the, um, among the, I remember his daughter, uh, Clara, she was mm -hmm. with me all the time and she was less upset that, than many of the, of the el elderly Americans, not elderly, older Americans. <laughs> and we had one journalist, a chain smoker, uh, Biljana Sekulska. And all the time she would go, oh, can I smoke, can I smoke? Of course not, you cannot smoke. I forgot that Biljana was with you. Yes. And um, then um, while Ambassador Hill was talking to, to, the, to President Gligorov, I was talking to, to his advisor, um, Eleonora Karanfiloska. We did not dare hang up because we didn't know if we would get uh, a dial tone again. Uh, what happened to me, I lived right across the street from the embassy back then and my son looked out of the bathroom window to see if his friends were playing basketball in the schoolyard. And um, he saw smoke coming out of the embassy and he said to my wife, guess what? Daddy's work is on fire. Well, she didn't like that. But the smoke he saw was this. Yeah. Yeah. This, that, that uh, uh, Jeep was zero kilometer. We had just brought it from, from customs. That other car belonged to the OMS of the ambassador. But the, the, the thing about the attack, you see this picture where they're trying to break in mm -hmm. with the flagpole? That's the only door they couldn't break. They were dumb. Uh, <laughs> had they moved, you know, three meters to the left, or to the right, they would have been able to remove the, the bars. Now, while we were in the, in the basement, we heard feet stomping and people got scared that uh, maybe the protesters are inside the embassy. Right. But I knew that, uh, you know, there's little classrooms for, uh, for uh, children, little children. They had patios and we heard their feet on the patios because we were outside. It was, it was not good. The, the only vehicle that survived the, the attack was my bicycle. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing that is extraordinary, Mitko, is that understandably, a number of personnel took, took authorized departure after the attack on the embassy. Uh, you went back to work the next day. Yes. That's yes. extraordinary. Well. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, it was night when we left and what we saw was, uh, you know, smoking vehicles, a broken fence, uh, you know, broken windows. And uh, in the morning, I walked to work because, I mean, what else do you do? Well, it's, you know, you wake up, you know, shave back then, no, no, no. And then you go to work yeah, shower and shave and go to work. And I went there and, um, you know, it was not only me, there were a few other people. And then there was Ambassador Chris Hill. He, he spoke to our staff and I was translating and we, uh, we cleaned up the, the, the trash because they, 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 they did not, they did not manage to get inside. So only the outside was, was damaged the damage was the damage was on on the people because people uh, did not have anything to write they were afraid 
they didn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So we had to bring back the embassy to its previous stature for people to want to come back to work and to have that sense of belonging, which we were pretty successful at developing back then. And everything that we did then, and during the Kosovo crisis, during the, this was before the, the flow of refugees, everything we did then, it was, it was for, um, for our children. I, mean, I did it for my children and the children of my next door neighbor who was accusing me of, uh, you brought all the Albanians to Macedonia. No, we did not. We just capsulated them because these people were hungry. They would go into, into a shop, steal a loaf of bread, and they have a problem. Same with the, with the embassy. We needed to show that we are the biggest guy on the block and that we take blows, but we recover quickly. Yeah. And that's what we did. We were up and running within two or three days. And then we had, um, uh, first we had uh, infantry mm -hmm. in the embassy. Then we had a few seals in front of the left. We had few seals, uh, tough guys that played in basketball because I, was I wasn't always this fat. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then we had, we had Marines. I had a Marine in my office and uh, that's where he slept. They had nests, uh, machine gun nests. Mm -hmm. And we had a little problem with the high school next door. Uh, kids were waving plastic guns. So I went to talk to the, to the principal of the school and I told them, look, your kids are wearing plastic guns. My kids have real guns. And you know, one day you'll wake up and you'll have a, you'll have a, you have a boy's life or a girl's life when you're, when you're conscious. So they, thank God they closed the, closed the windows of the high school that we're looking at, uh, looking at the embassy. It's, again, it's hard to say why that happened because there was no anti-American mood to begin with. Yeah, I mean, like everywhere else, people like or better, some people don't like. Macedonians mm -hmm. and Albanians in Macedonia were all pro-Western. Mm -hmm. And it was, it came as a surprise to me because the night before uh, the embassy was looted, I was uh, in my Albanian language class. And, uh, you know, when we heard 1712, that's when, 1714, that's when it started. Yeah. And uh, when we heard, you know, class dismissed, everybody went home and they were biting their fingernails. They thought Macedonia is next because everybody believed that uh, the, the US is siding with the Albanians. Mm -hmm. And then the rumors started going, oh, they're gonna create greater Albania, what are we going to do and stuff like that. And the, that's it, that didn't happen. We prevented it. Uh, we prevented the country going down the drain for over, over rumors and over maybe not well grounded, but still existing fear. Yeah. Well, speaking of fear, and speaking of, of misunderstandings, let's let's fast forward a couple of years now to 2001 oh. <laughs> and. Uh, and really with the country now uh, on the brink of full out civil war and the role of this embassy and you in the signing of the Oak Ridge Framework Agreement, which was an agreement between the then Republic of Macedonia and the Albanian minority here in yes. this country. Uh, that was so critical to ensuring that that potential civil war was yes. averted. Talk a little bit about that, Mirko. When uh, the, war, the, the, the shooting started in March of 2001, and uh, we were running around collecting information. We were activating our contacts and uh, our sources of information across the board from, you know, from petty drug dealers to, to the president, because these people knew they were, they were, some of them were providing the money for for the purchase of the weapons. And as we were running around, we we needed to cross-check our sources. We need to talk to everybody. We need to pile up enough credible information of our own for the embassy to, um, to digest it into knowledge and then be able to make a well-informed decision, which was... Uh, 
not always easy. You know, you go talk to the Macedonian side, they will say, oh, nobody respects the truce, nobody does that. Then there were all sorts of uh, rumors that uh, actually the command was in Kosovo and that and because Kosovo was under K4, and people said, no, it's again, the Americans are doing something to the Macedonians because if they want to, mm -hmm. they can stop the spill of, of the war. So it was of crucial importance for us to get information, credible information from our credible sources for the embassy to do what the embassy did actually well. Mm -hmm to be a factor in the talks between uh, the Albanian political parties mm -hmm. and the Macedonian political parties, because, you know, nobody spoke to the, to the Uchaka. People, people were talking, oh yeah, people were talking to each other. So while we were in Skopje, we were feeding information into uh, Ambassador James Pardue mm -hmm. and one Laurel Miller in Ohrid yeah. to help them better understand. Unfortunately, the complexities of the Macedonian issue and the Macedonian country, those complexities exceed by far the interest that those complexity raise among the big time decision yeah. makers. So, you know, I remember, for example, Ambassador Larry Butler here said, yeah. so give me uh, something about the Macedonian Serbian Orthodox Church in 500 words. Well, <laughs> I cannot, sorry. And the same thing was back then. But uh, Ambassador Butler, who came mm -hmm. as uh, uh, Charge de Affairs first, because the previous Ambassador Einig had left, he was very energetic and he was, he had his ear to the ground and, uh, you know, we, did a great job. We prevented a full-scale war, even though I think that the first set of negotiators, uh, one Leotard and Ambassador uh, Pardieu, they did the, the demolishing mm -hmm. work. And then came James Holmes and one uh, French, uh, Alan Leroy, and they did the finances. And we, after the framework agreement was, was signed, we had a job to make it a part of the Macedonian mm -hmm. constitution. For that purpose, I spent days and days in the Macedonian parliament talking to my uh, uh, particularly Vomero uh, contacts because they were kind of hesitant. Mm -hmm. uh, and many in the SDSM were also hesitant, persuading them that uh, this was, this agreement was first signed by their leadership Secondly, that this agreement was a very bitter pill for a terminal disease. And uh, many understood, despite some leaks to the press, and well, many understood, and eventually, with the exception of six, uh, those constitute the framework agreement from Ohrid was literally copy pasted into the constitution. And uh, though it's kind of strange, it's, uh, it allowed for a cessation of the, uh, of the hostilities and um, allowed some sort of normality uh, mm -hmm. in, in life. And then it was important to implement the framework agreement. Right. We have people go back to the fields with Ambassador Butler. We had uh, tractor offensives. Uh, we, we set up an office in Parliament uh, during the post framework agreement negotiations on the details now what the, the form would be of the passport and the ID card and whether it will be in the Albanian, Turkish, Macedonian languages. All these things that uh, nobody's bothered with today were mega important back then and people were prepared to go back to the hills or mm. go back to arms again if, but uh, fortunately, uh, we have, as an embassy, we have an image of uh, being the uh, credible point of reference. If something is unclear, they come to us and what we say, they, 
they, they trust us because so far we have not lied to them. We have not lied to the public. Maybe we haven't said the whole truth all the time, but we have not lied to the Macedonian public, yeah. unlike other uh, entities, political parties and other embassies. You know. So now, Mitko, we're gonna go to questions that we are taking from our audience. Okay. And here's the first one. Uh, we are all inspired by your dedication, selflessness, uh -huh. and unwavering courage to support the US mission. Americans abroad and initiatives from North Mas for North Macedonia's peace, security, and prosperity. Based on your life experiences, how would you define bravery and courage? Great question. It is more difficult to define bravery and courage now because when you need to be brave and courageous, you just do it. Because you know that there is a problem that needs to be resolved. Because if that problem grows, then it threatens the well being of your family and the family of your neighbors and even the families of your opponents. Mm -hmm. So you do what's necessary to resolve a problem. Afterwards, you know, other people will say, oh, that was brave. Well, guess what? I, I didn't think. I was in danger when I was going across the border <laughs> because if I if I did, I wouldn't have gone across the border. I'm not sure I believe you. Yeah. All right. Uh, anyway, but keep they, on. <laughs> they were they were shooting at us in the mountains. You could hear the, you know, bullets. They don't go like pew like in the movies. Bullets snap when they when they pass close to you. You simply don't have time to think about whether that's courageous or not, you know. And uh, I don't consider myself a brave person. I uh, don't, you know. I think that uh, it is humane to do things, aim, you know, to help to help other human beings. And the danger, you think about it later. And um, you know, thank God for scotch. Well, <laughs> well, you know what, Mitko, there are an awful lot of people who don't have that moral courage that you had. So we are very grateful. But there's more questions. Uh, so what is the best piece of advice you ever received? And what impact has it had on your life? And did it come from me? I'm just kidding. That was uh, well, <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, yes. But you must have forgotten that that one day. You know, oh, don't quote me. No. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that the best piece of advice I got was from my um, my mom's stepfather, who was a combatant for 17 years, wow. and um, he he said, you know, keep your integrity and your faith, and uh, you must remain confident in the victory of good over evil. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not religious; I don't really, but there is something that if you maintain your internal vertical, then things are much easier mm. because then things don't come at the cost that you have to carry with you all the time. You know, if it's something you pay with money, then you, you can earn money, but you cannot earn peace yeah. with yourself when you wake up and you say, and you talk to yourself in the morning, not to the little people in my head, just, just to my head. Then it's, it's like a soundboard and you say, okay, I did this well. And uh, that is the, the advice I've, I've taken from that man who, who never killed a man, only soldiers. So the last question, I think, uh, oh wait, there's another. Throughout the years, you courageously held to your convictions and supported US Embassy Skopje through the most challenging circumstances and at great personal risk. I also know this to be true. That includes wiretapping, personal threats, smear campaigns. How did you stay resilient during those? Uh, the only thing I had in my mind it was my family. I mean, these questions refer to the years after 2015 during the uh, eavesdroppings uh, right. and the, the release of illegal wiretaps. And when um, parts of what is now the opposition uh, started attacking me and uh, particularly my daughter. Now, when you want to 
protect your family. It is uh, out of your mind to let your heart dictate your ratio. Your ratio has to be above, above your emotions. And that is how you maintain your cool. And that is how you maintain um, calm because only when you're calm, you can make the rational decisions to protect yourself and your family and your mm-hmm. colleagues and, and, and your job and everything. Yeah. But um, if you let emotions uh, drive you, then you go out, you, you get a gun and you whack somebody and then you're in prison and your family's on the street. So that's why you always have to be, you know, rational and uh, have techniques to cope with the stress afterwards. I play cards and uh, and I like uh, smoky PT and medicinal whiskey and that helps <laughs> to cope with the stress. I also know that to be true. Uh, okay, last question, ready? Today, as you know, you are being honored as a hero of US diplomacy, very rightfully so. If I'm a you hero I... of US diplomacy, then the ambassadors that tasked me with things to do and allowed me to do things, what are they, superheroes of American diplomacy? Yeah. Um, who, uh, who in history do you admire most and how has this person affected your life? And I'll just add that there's from the viewing party, and this is a critically important question, are you going to be Santa again this year for the embassy's New Year party? I have never Talk been... about hero of U.S. diplomacy. <laughs> I have never been Santa in this embassy. I know for a fact that it's the real center that comes to this embassy, so. Correct, yeah. thank you for dispelling that. Um, but let's go back to who uh, inspires you. I, I honestly, I do not have a hero, but uh, I am inspired by uh, my favorite philosopher, Seneca. And- um, That's great. But I like to read a lot and I'm ex- inspired by, actually um, I admire people that sit down and write a book and write a, write a good story. And uh, my hero is my library. And in my library, I have every book, I have every book on amazon.com that mentions the words Macedonian Balkans that deals in sociology, anthropology, political science, and history. And I've read them all. I'm not saying that I'm a scientist or anything. I just have read them all like, like a story. You know? And uh, it helps. And that is something that I, I advise people to keep working on yourself. And how do you work on yourself? You know? Well, thank you. That's, uh, and you know, today is the International Day of Philosophy. So that's a great answer. Oh, love for wisdom. Uh, um, yes. So, and, and please pass on to Santa that we're looking forward to seeing him again this year okay. at the party. And now finally, uh, I, it is my great pleasure to introduce somebody uh, over, <laughs> And there he is now. Ever fitter and bolder. Over your, <laughs> over your 30-year career, you have also inspired many of your colleagues, including me, and affected their lives. And one of them is here with us today who would like to share a very special message with you. And I believe that is Vedran Andonovsky, who we have. Hi, Hello. Mitko. How are you? Life is good. <laughs> well, my age, you wake up in the morning and you're better than many. <laughs> I, I hope this explains why I haven't called you to congratulate you. So. It does. Right. Well, who would have thought that uh, when Embassy Scopia was established, uh, that some 30 years later, the original locally employed political and media assistants would talk to each other from different sides of the Atlantic over video link to honor the political (laughs) assistant as one of the State Department's heroes of US diplomacy. In all honesty, I think that we both sort of did. I think that we knew even back then that we were part of something bigger that you explained. Uh, All of those days coming early to the embassy to read the newspaper and prepare to brief the ambassador, (laughs) visiting people and places oftentimes uh, during unrest to gather first-hand information. Then coming back to the embassy, working late at night to to write cables about local conditions. I think we know now that uh, this was the foundation of the bridge between the United States and North Macedonia. 
a connection that might have been unimaginable probably just a couple of uh, decades before. And I ask you to, I ask to give you this tribute not because I'm the one who cannot stumble over <laughs> your, your first and last name, but because I wanted to vouch from firsthand experience as your colleague from those days that Mitko Burczewski is more than worthy of uh, receiving this honor. And on behalf of so many among Embassy Skopje's locally employed staff, former and present, congratulations, Mitko. Čestitki in Macedonia. Way to go and well deserved. Bear with me. You know why he says this? Because uh, I pulled him out of a violent clash between police and rioters in Gostivar in uh, 1997, was it? I believe when so. When that poor intern said, oh, Mitko, my mama sent me here and asked me to not mingle with bad people and look at where I am now. <laughs> One cell phone for the whole team. That was good days. Congratulations Thank you, once again. Great to see you. The times, the times of... Uh, pioneers with raccoon tail heads, which we were during the early days of the embassy, are gradually going away. Now it's time for bureaucrats with his shades here and the black sleeves, you know, and a pushing pencil and uh, yeah, well, that's, not, that's a coat, not a black sleeve. <laughs> but um, yeah, those days were really interesting. I mean, it, I, it would take several hours to to tell the stories. And in one day, in one day, I packed a dead American in Veles into a plastic bag, brought her to the military hospital in Skopje. And just as I was having uh, drinks and uh, tripe soup in Pivnica, and Vedran remembers that place, uh, one uh, Jim Bright, he was the military attache, he came and said, Mitko and Len, there's something going on in uh, Tetovo, go observe. And we went to the opening of the uh, Tetovo University in, in, a, in a village near Tetovo, which resulted in a violent clash between police and, and rioters. So it was a day that started shortly after midnight and ended shortly before midnight the next day. So, but I Well, it's been an amazing adventure. Uh, and thank you, Miko, it's been my pleasure to share this with you and to have you here still part of the team thank you for being here and with that i think i'm going to uh send it back to our colleagues at the foreign service institute thank you ambassador aguilar thank you vedron for that heartfelt tribute and thank you mitko for sharing your incredible and inspiring story and to all of our guests for engaging in a fascinating discussion. Please visit the State Department's website for a video recording of this event and additional information about the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative. That concludes today's virtual program. Thanks again for joining us.